Today we're in Acts chapter 2, so I'm going to pray and we'll get right to work. Father, we pray for your, uh, the anointing of your Holy Spirit, whom you promised to send to lead us into all truth. And uh, your word is truth, and your spirit gives us wisdom and discernment to comprehend what it says and what it means and empowers us as well to put feet on our faith and do it. And so we're praying for, for, all, for all of that today. Lord, meet us here in this place, pour out your spirit, uh, uh, lead us by your spirit into truth and help us to be doers who are not hearers only and we pray it in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. All right. Uh, last week we looked at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here in, uh, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. We focused on the prophetic significance of the feast of Pentecost and we saw that in fact there are seven Jewish feasts um, that are celebrated by the Jews and that each one of these has a very specific New Testament fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we saw also that prophetically speaking, four of these seven feasts have been completed in Christ. The Feast of Passover, where Jesus is our Passover lamb, uh, slain for us upon the cross. Uh, secondly, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where Jesus is our unleavened bread of life. He is the sinless, perfect sacrifice. Um, the third feast completed, prophetically, is the Feast of First Fruits, um, where Jesus has been raised to life as the first fruits of all who will believe. And here now in our text, exactly 50 days later, we have the fulfillment prophetically of the fourth feast, which is completed in Christ. That's the feast of Pentecost. Pentecost pointing to Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit and the great harvest of souls uh, for both Jew and Gentile who are going to be brought uh, into the kingdom of God during the church age, which is what we are living in uh, now. And today, as we continue through Acts chapter 2, our focus is on the supernatural. We're focusing on the supernatural. And the big idea of our message today is this, that Christianity isn't just another religion. As a matter of fact, it's not a religion at all. Christianity is a supernatural work of God. And, and this is a work that's not random, it, it, it's not by chance, it's not dependent on our circumstances, it's not just for a select few, it's not just those who, for those who are worthy or good enough, because newsflash ain't none of us good enough, um, it's a supernatural work of God. It was arranged by God, it was proclaimed by God, it is sustained by God, and it is for everyone, it's for all y'all this supernatural work of God. Everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. We can live supernaturally in the power of God right now, today. We can receive supernatural visions. We can receive uh, supernatural dreams. Um, we, we can be empowered by God himself, by the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, who is a he and not an it, right? And, and this this spirit empowerment will empower us to do things we never dreamt possible. Uh, you know, I've told this story before. Forgive me if you've heard it, but it's such a good illustration of what we're talking about. Years ago, um, I had planted a Revival Christian Fellowship, started as a, as a Bible study uh, in my home, I'd been there for 15 years, and I'd watched God just pour out his spirit, just back the truck up and unload, just incredible work of God, and God had spoken to me, and he told me that it was time for me to go on a venture of faith, and so by faith, I, 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 I stepped out, I had no idea where I was going, didn't, had no idea what God wanted me to do, um, but I just said, hey guys, do, you know, I just want your blessing to go out and do what God's called me to do. Uh, what is that? I don't know. I'll let you know when, when, when I know what it is. Okay. So, so I stepped out in faith. And during this time, don't you know, I'm doing a lot of praying, a lot of fasting, a lot of reading God's word. And I'm like, what on earth are you doing? And so one night I'm going to bed and I have this conversation with God. I, I said, basically, look, God, you say in your word that young men have visions, old men dream dreams. I, I don't know which, which category I fit in right? But, uh, but I'm open. If you want to give me a dream, like you know that I'm seeking you here. If you want to give me a dream, I'm listening. 
I kid you not, that night God gave me a dream. And I know that it was a, it was a Holy Spirit anointed dream because, well, how do I sum it up? I was wrestling at this point with, okay, I've stepped out in faith, and I kind of, I, I kind of knew in the back of my mind God wanted me to plant a church. But, but I was a little chicken to do it again. And, I, and I'm like, you know, good grief. At this stage in my life, like, really, seriously? What if I plant a church and nobody comes? You know, kind of thing. And, uh, and I just didn't know. So, so there was a ministry in Seattle. I kind of liked it. And I thought, well, I'll just go to work with them up there. And so this is what I'm wrestling with as I go to bed. And so the dream that I have is that the, the pastor of that church in Seattle was killed in a traffic accident. And, um, and, and it wasn't prophetic in the sense of, hey, this is going to happen to him. It was, it, well, God made it clear. I have this dream, very vivid, and then I wake up from the dream, my very first conscious thought, God took me to John chapter 21. And you know the scene where, where you know, the Lord's telling Peter everything that he's going to suffer for him, for his namesake and, and all. And, and Peter looks at the apostle John, and he's like, well, what about him? What about him? They have sort of this, this competition, this rivalry, right? And, and what does Jesus say to, to Peter at that point? He's like, that ain't none of your business. Whatever I do with him, that's my business. He said, and this was God speaking to me, you follow me. And instantaneously, the Holy Spirit gave me the interpretation. He took the dream, he took the scripture, and then he said this, if you go to Seattle, you're following a man, and I want you to follow me. I'm like, that's God. I asked him for a dream. He says in his word, he gives dreams. He gave me not just the dream, he gave me scripture, and he gave me application, and it was completely within the context of, of all of this, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to Seattle. Let me tell you, that happened exactly 16 years ago in March, and the result was that I planted this church. And, and it, was, it was just this supernatural work. And God has a supernatural work for all of us. This is what we are going to be leaning into today. Acts chapter 2. Um, we're, we're just picking up in context in, in verse 1. We'll catch up to, to where we're going to be beginning in verse 12. But it, it says here, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came um, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And so here we have the power, the manifestation of the power of the spirit. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. Here we have a, a symbol of the purity, uh, purifying work of the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now what are they speaking? Well you skip down to verse 11. The, the testimony of those that are hearing them speak all of these different languages is this. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And so what they're, this now is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Leads us into all truth and the proclamation of the wonderful works of God. So you've got the power of God, the purity of God, the promise of God working through his Holy Spirit. And so verse 12, it says, and by the way, all of those verses we just read, we covered last week. And so if you're just catching up to us, you can listen to the message from last week where we unpack that a little more. But verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And others mocking said, well, they are full of new wine. Those guys are drunk. That's what's going on, right? So here we see there's two groups with two reactions to a supernatural work that's going on, right? A supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You got those who are shocked, and you've got those who mocked. And whenever God does something that's supernatural, typically these are, the, these are two of the responses that you'll see, right? How many of you have seen the movie Jesus Revolution? Can I see a show of hands? So, so many of you, those of you that didn't raise your hand, you gotta go see this movie. You have to see this movie. It's just incredible. And <clears throat> the movie is uh, it's basically based on a true story 
of an event that happened here in, in on, started on the West Coast, moved across the country in the late 60s and, and 70s. Um, it, it was a supernatural manifestation of the Spirit of God. And, and what we saw then is that this was a time of, of massive unrest, of, of massive national upheaval, and, uh, and it was, it, then like now, it was really a time where you had a generation of kids that are disillusioned, they're searching, uh, and, and really ultimately they're searching for God. They don't know it, but they were. Now, I lived through that era, and, and, and I can tell you, man, this was the real deal. It was, it was, you know, I watched my own family impacted by what God was doing through, through this ministry as the spirit was being poured out. I watched my older sister who, who was in a situation that wasn't, wasn't following after the Lord, wasn't honoring the Lord, was starting to get into trouble. And I watched how the spirit of God moving through people, through this, this supernatural outpouring of his spirit, I watched these people come alongside my sister and minister the gospel to her, and I, I watched her as she was just born again and transformed by the Spirit of God. And let me tell you, it wasn't Pastor Chuck who had this burden. It was his wife, Kay, who had this burden. Pastor Chuck's attitude in the beginning was, oh, these dirty hippies, they need to, to take a bath and get a haircut and get a job. And that was his attitude. He, he will tell you, he would tell us that, right? And, uh, and, and he, he said, his own, this is his testimony, he said it was my, wife's, my wife Kay who had the burden. And, and Kay would see these kids and she would weep over them. She, would, she, she was concerned with them. She'd get Chuck to drive her down. Uh, to Newport Beach where they would congregate just to, to watch them, and it was her burden. And of course, we know that, that uh, Chuck would get this burden and then God would bring Lonnie Frisbee into, into the mix and all, and, and there was a great outpouring of the Spirit. But here's the deal. Um, it, uh, what happened wasn't because of Kay Smith, and it wasn't because of Chuck Smith, and it wasn't because of Lonnie Frisbee, or it wasn't because of Greg Glory or anybody else there. What happened was because it was a move of the Holy Spirit. And, and ultimately, this would spread ac across the country. Why? Because it was a manifestation of the supernatural power of God. It was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't man-made. And so for that reason, there was massive fruit. Kids by the thousands are getting radically saved. And, and, and just like here in our text, though, some people mocked it. Some people would look at what was happening, and they'd look at these kids, and they'd call them, you know, Jesus freaks. And they would scoff and make fun of people that are having their lives radically transformed. So there's Peter, and, and he stands up, and we see him answer these two groups. Right? So the first group that he answers is those who are mocking, those who are scoffing. And we see it there in verse 14 and 15. It says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, he raised his voice and he said to them, Men of Judea, uh, of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be made known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That would be nine o'clock in the morning. He says, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And so, so what he does is he's addressing first those who mocked. He says, look, it's nine o'clock in the morning. And, you know, the, the backdrop here is that it's the Feast of Pentecost. It's religious Jews gathered together. And what the practice of this time would have been is that everybody who's gathered together there in Jerusalem is spending that time in prayer. They're seeking the Lord. This, would, this was the time that was specifically reserved for that. And so what Peter's saying here is, look, we've been spending time with God, and this isn't an alcohol spirit thing. This is a Holy Spirit thing. And you guys need to know that. And so he shuts down those who are mocking, and then he answers those who were shocked. These are the ones that back in verse 12, we're looking at this going, what could this be? mean. And the idea there is that they know that this is special. They know that this is supernatural. They're like, this doesn't happen every day, and this means something. And so Peter speaks to that, and he stands up. Now, by the way, this is 
a huge departure from the Peter that we've known before this, right? The Peter that we've known before this, I mean, chronologically, as we read this story, two weeks ago, where was Peter? Well, I'll tell you where Peter was and put it on the screen for you. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 69, it says, Peter sat outside in the courtyard. He's in the courtyard of the high priest. They've taken Jesus uh, and, they, and now he's on trial. Peter follows from a distance. Oh, even though everybody denies you, I'll never deny you. Yeah, and now he's following from a distance. He's in, outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70 but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he'd gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but again he denied with an oath. I don't know the man. And a little later, those who began to, uh, or I'm sorry, those, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them for, and this is significant, your speech betrays you. What they're talking about is his accent. You're Galilean. We recognize that. Hold that thought because that's going to be significant. We'll come back to that. And he says, then he remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, oh, by the way, he began to curse and swear. He said, I don't know him. Immediately a rooster crowed and Peter remembered the words of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. So, so here in Acts, it ain't two weeks later from that, and, and now it's not, you know, some little girl who's challenging him. No, who is it? It's thousands of Jews. Some of these, many of these, no doubt, were among those who shouted, hey, crucify Jesus. Give us Barabbas. Like these are, you know, and now Peter's standing before all of them, and here now he stands up boldly. What has changed? The Holy Spirit, that's what's changed. The Holy Spirit was, pointed out, it was poured out. And by the way, where they would say before, your speech betrays you, well, what's going on here? Now, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter, he hasn't been speaking with a Galilean accent. He's been speaking with a heavenly empowering from the Holy Spirit of God to among the other disciples who were there preaching, he's speaking in the language of the people, right? The Holy Spirit has made, you know, a radical difference in, in his life and is moving and working and, and has empowered him. Didn't Jesus promise, Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. Now that phrase, the Holy Spirit, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We know this as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? It's a special empowering that happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us. Luke 24, verse 49, the Holy Spirit there is described as power from on high that clothes us, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. We're going to be, uh, get this power that clothes, clothes us. John 14, 16, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is our helper who's going to be with us forever. Uh, Romans 8, 26 uh, says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And Jesus promised this, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit of God is available today for us. And before we're done with this service, I'm going to give you the opportunity to pray and to ask God to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And you're like, oh, okay, here it goes. Where's the box of snakes, right? No, it's nothing like that. It is nothing like that. Because I, what I want you to see here, and I have put this on the screen for you, Peter had a biblical basis for this supernatural phenomenon. He had a biblical basis for this supernatural phenomenon. In other words, what, they are, what he and the disciples are engaged in is that they're not doing some emotional man-made event based on, you know, goosebumps and feelings and all of that. No, this is a legit move of the Spirit and it's a legit move of the Spirit that is 
supported by scripture. Listen, there needs to be a real biblical basis for what you do. Acts chapter two, verse 16. Peter says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What you see right now, what's happening right now, there's a biblical basis for it. Joel said, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so here Peter is, he's saying, look, let me tell you biblically what's going on. This is that. This is what Joel said. This is, this is it. It's being fulfilled in, your, uh, in, in, in your, your hearing of this. It's real biblical based on scripture. And he says, if you will hear and heed what God is doing, and if you'll respond to it, he says, you're going to be saved. Now listen, this was true then. It was true in the Jesus revolution of the 60s. And listen, it's true today. It's true today. And before we're done today, not only am I going to give some of you, or all of you, the opportunity to be baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give some of you today, some of you here, you need to give your life to Jesus. I'm going to give you that opportunity today. And, and, and I'm going to invite you today to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, to confess that you're a sinner, to confess that Jesus is the Savior, and to invite him to come and to make you a new creation like you promised and to change you from the inside out, to forgive you of all of your sins. And in the verses that follow, Peter's going to preach that gospel. And the same Holy Spirit who has fallen upon these disciples to go out and witness and proclaim, proclaim the wonderful works of God is going to work through Peter as Peter is going to proclaim the gospel to those that are gathered here. We're going to see 3,000 people give their lives to him on this day. Maybe you can be added among them on this day today. But before we go there, let's explore this idea that there needs to be a real biblical basis for what we do. Because let's just candidly confess that, that Christians do a lot of wacky things. And we put Jesus' name on a lot of stuff that Jesus stands back and goes, I, I got nothing to do with that, right? So, so we need to acknowledge that. The, the reason why there needs to be a real biblical basis for what we do is because there is zero power in the works of our flesh, there is no power in that. You know, currently we see the Asbury revival that's going on in Kentucky, and it's an amazing move of God's spirit. That's my conclusion. And I've had some people go, well, gosh, why don't we do an event like that? And, and here's my response. I, I say, look, I, I'm not going to manufacture something, because here's the thing. We, we already have a, a regularly scheduled time of worship and prayer and a time of giving over to the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. We call it First Wednesday. We do, and we, we gather and we give ourselves to, to the Lord, and it's his business how he wants to move and work and respond in that. As well, every Sunday, we got a group of people that are praying. Y'all are welcome to come and join us from 6.30 to 7.30 here every Sunday. We gather and we pray. And we're in, we're in the B building, in the multi-purpose room there. You can just show up and join us if you want. We would welcome you to do that. We've been doing that, you know, forever. Since before we were on this property, since we've been a church, we pray on Sunday mornings, just seeking the Lord. God, what do you want to do? We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, our, our women have a prayer meeting here every Wednesday, 9 a.m. You're welcome, ladies, to attend that. So, so the deal for us is, you know, we, we want a moving miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. We desire it. And our job is to, is to seek him and be available for that. But it's his prerogative how he's going to move and work and what he's going to do. 
So, so we're not going to manufacture something. We're simply going to do what he's called us to do. We're going to wait upon him. That's what we're doing. And so, so look, hey, if the, if the Lord decides he, he wants to, to, you know, blow something up supernaturally beyond what it is that we're already doing, hey, we're open to that. And kind of here's the heart of it, Colossians 3, 17. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, when we do something in Jesus' name, it can't just be that we do our thing and then we stamp Jesus' name on it. Right? The, the issue is we need to pray and we need to operate in Jesus' name. And, and the idea is praying and operating in his will and, and thanking him for how he responds, whatever that might be and whatever that might look like. And we just are, God, whatever you want to do. And, and we're, we're, we're all in. But there needs to be a real biblical basis for the stuff that we're doing. And this informs everything that we do. And we need to take a walk with this. You need to take a walk with this. Why do we worship? Why is it? What's the biblical basis for that? Why do we tithe? Why do we give our money to the Lord? There has to be a biblical basis for why we do it, right? Why do we study the Bible? Why do we get baptized? By the way, next baptism is Easter Sunday. It's not too late to sign up. You can sign up for being baptized. This is something, why do we do it? Here's why, because the Lord commands all of these things in his word right? Why do we pray? God commands it. Why do we prioritize the gathering together of the saints on Sunday morning? Because God commands it. Why do we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why are we going to pray that today? Because God commands it, right? The Lord knows how to give good gifts. We as fathers, we know how to give good gifts to our kids. He knows how to give good gifts to his kids. And how much more, Jesus said, Will he give the baptism of the Spirit to those who ask? He wants us to ask. And listen, this is important for us and it's important for everybody we're going to encounter. Peter said this, 1 Peter 3, 15, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And so Peter says, listen, to the multitude who are asking this question, what could this mean? He's like, this is what the prophet Joel was prophesying about. By the way, the address there is Joel 2, 28 through 32, these same verses that we read here in Acts chapter 2. And Peter says, this is what Joel was talking about. It's a prophecy of the last days, the days after the fulfillment of the feast of the Passover, where Jesus has become our Passover lamb. It's after the feast of unleavened bread, where Jesus is, is our sinless, perfect sacrifice, the, the unleavened bread of life. It's after the feast of first fruits have been fulfilled where Jesus has been raised to life. He's the first fruits of all who are going to believe. And, and it's after the feast of Pentecost that's been fulfilled where Jesus has sent his promised Holy Spirit and he's here and he's bringing a great harvest of souls. And Peter's like, this is that time. This is going on. Get the memo. Everybody else is on page 12. Let's go. This is it. It's going down. We're living in the last days. And by the way, that means that the next prophecy to be fulfilled, the next prophetic feast on the calendar to be fulfilled, it's the Feast of Trumpets. When God raptures his church, are you ready? Because the Bible says the day is coming, and it happened at any minute. Jesus is going to be like, let's go, everybody out of the pool. He's going to be, it's going to be time. And that could happen at any moment. Are you ready for that moment? 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet's gonna sound and the dead will be raised into corruptible and we shall be changed. But listen, he says, you have to call upon the Lord. You gotta call upon him. Look at that, verse 21. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the idea here is it's more than just saying the name of Jesus, this calling upon the Lord. It's confessing the name of Jesus. Confession. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess means to agree with God. God, I agree that I'm a sinner, that, 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 that I'm separated from you for my sin. 
<coughs> I agree with you that I need to be cleansed and forgiven of my sin. And I agree that you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God who, who was the perfect sinless sacrifice for me that you died on the cross in my place for my sin. And I confess and believe that you were raised from the dead and that just as you were raised from the dead, you promise to everybody who confesses you as Lord and Savior, who, who gives their life to you and who believes upon you, that you will raise them from the dead as well. This is the idea of calling upon the name of the Lord. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that today. <clears throat> and so, this calling upon the Lord is a confession and a surrender to the name of Jesus. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And so here, Peter goes on, and he says, I'm gonna, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you're going to be saved, and now he's going to preach the gospel. He says, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. You saw him raise people from the dead. You, the, the man in Nain coming out on his funeral procession, procession, God raised him from the dead. Lazarus, God raised him from the dead. Woman with an issue of blood, Jesus healed her. You, you, you watched all of these, these people who were infirmed and sick and coming to the Lord. The paralytic whose buddies lowered him down from the road. All of these things. You saw these things. And it, God attested Jesus to you by all of these things. These miracles, these wonders, these signs. Jesus said <clears throat> that, you know, as we read verses 19 and 20, when, when, uh, when Peter proclaims, hey, God's going to show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth and blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned to darkness, all these things. You know, the, Jesus said these things were coming. What happened when they crucified him? Sun was turned to darkness. Three days. It happened. And, and Peter's saying in verse 22, hey, you saw all this. He says, verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and you've crucified him and you've put him to death. Verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. What does Peter do here? He proclaims the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, but the grave couldn't hold him. And he was raised the third day to, to eternal life. And just like that, Jesus died for your sins. You can be dead to sin and you can be raised up. You can be alive to God through Christ Jesus. This is the work that God wants to do in your life. But it takes confession and calling upon the name of the Lord. For, Peter says, David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. Peter says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the, of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we're all witnesses. We've all seen that. We know it's true. And therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord, sit at my Lord, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. And therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, 
And now he sticks the knife in and twists it, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And maybe you're asking that question today. What do I do? Because my sin is thick. My guilt and shame is heavy. What do I do? And then Peter said to them, verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent simply means to turn. Now, this doesn't mean that you turn and you get all religious and you start doing good and trying harder because that ain't going to get you there. That's, that's a very short road to failure. Repentance means I'm on the wrong road that leads to death and I'm turning to Jesus and I'm crying out to Jesus. Jesus, it's only by your work on the cross that I can be made right with you, God. And I, I want to confess that and I want to take hold of that. And I need your spirit to live obediently. And this is what God promises here. For the promise, he says, it's to you, these Jews that are gathered on this day that we're reading about, it's to your children, and this is to the future, right? And to all who are afar off. That's, put your name there. That's you. As many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and he exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And when those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. God wants to add you to the family of God today. God wants to baptize you with his Holy Spirit today. In time of prayer this morning as we're gathered uh, together, and we do every week, there's a group of us, we're praying for all of y'all. We're praying for what God wants to do here every Sunday. And this morning as we're praying, the Lord just prompted me to pray, God, what would it look like if we were all baptized in the Holy Spirit and said, Lord, here, here I am. Lord, do what you want to do. What, what, would, what would this city look like? What would, what, would this, what would it look like if we were to obey God in that way? Three questions as we close. Number one, ask yourself this. Have I called upon the name of Jesus and have I confessed him as Lord and Savior? I'm gonna give you that opportunity in just a second. Question number two, is there a biblical basis for the things that I do? It's remarkable how often God's voice sounds really suspiciously like our voice, right? Is there a biblical basis for the things that you put God's name on? And the third question have I been baptized in the Holy Spirit? 